I would like to introduce the first of our two speakers in this sec session. This is uh, a person who is one of the founding members of the Basic Income European Network, which is now the Basic Income Earth Network, made back in 1986, um, and who wrote the book Real Freedom for All, What, If Anything, Can Justify Capitalism. Turns out it's only basic income that can do it. I, sorry to give away the ending there. And, uh, he is also a uh, professor at the Catholic University of Louvain, and he is seated to my right. His name is Philippe Van Parijs. In order to move forward, we need two things, at least. One is a vision, and the other one is opportunism. A vision of a future that is both desirable and feasible. Desirable in the sense that it can be defended in front of everyone, not just on the basis of our specific tastes or our specific interests, and feasible in the sense of sustainable, all things considered, not in the sense of politically feasible here and now. In order to make the vision of the future feasible, politically feasible, we need opportunism. We need to seize opportunities. And we won't seize these opportunities without a close collaboration between two sorts of people. Those I call the butter de cul, les, the body kickers on the one hand, and on the other hand, the bricoleurs, the tinkers, or the fiddlers. So um, we need two things, vision and uh, opportunism. And to seize the opportunities, we need to see these two categories of people. These two categories of people, uh, so really the militants who push forward, possibly with unrealistic proposals, but driven by a sense of injustice on the one hand, and on the other hand, the people who think about how to modify the system, to find the little crevices, uh, the little uh, spots where uh, movement, where progress could be uh, introduced. Of course, most of these opportunities today uh, can only be seized where, the, where most of the action is in terms of social policy, which is at the national uh, level. And that's the level at which most of the meaningful, concrete debates need to take place. For example, the debate alluded to several times this morning about a partial basic income. The discussion is not a discussion between partial basic income and full basic income. I personally, I'm in favor, including as argued in that book, in favor of the highest sustainable basic income at the, uh, on a scale that is the high, the largest that is politically imaginable. That's the ultimate objective. But the meaningful discussion is not about partial basic income versus full basic income. The meaningful discussion, as uh, already uh, hinted at by several today, is between, say, uh, a next step consisting in a partial basic income versus a next step consisting, as proposed by Ronald, for example, in a sort of full basic income for children and the young people and keeping things as they are for all the people, or as proposed by the APN, rather uh, an adequate, uh, uh, generous minimum income that would remain family related and that would remain means tested. These are discussions which need to be uh, conducted in each a particular context, and the, the, the answer that is appropriate, say, for Germany is not necessarily the one that's most appropriate for Greece, where there, were, there may be more urgent things to do than, uh, say, a partial basic income or a, a basic income for, for children, and not the same as in Brazil, and not the same as uh, in Ireland, etc., etc. But what I want to talk about uh, today, briefly, is something that can be done and that should be done, in my view, at a level of power that has emerged in matters of social policy only recently, namely the European Union. And it is, therefore, something that is particularly relevant for the new network that is about to be born. 
Um, I uh, tested the idea at the Bien Congress in uh, Munich uh, nearly uh, two years ago, and then I uh, published a short paper presenting the idea under the title The Europe. Uh, the, the Euro Dividend, a uh, small paper that has then subsequently been translated into a number of languages. What do I propose there? I propose the introduction of a basic income, uh, so an income that is uh, strictly individual, unconditional, universal, at the level of the European Union, and funded essentially by a VAT of 19%, that European a VAT of 19%, that is about 10% of uh, European GDP. Um, why do I propose that? For four reasons, which I'll quickly sketch. The first reason, uh, in a sense that's the opportunity that is being created, is the sustainability, the stabilization of the euro. Before the euro was born, uh, economists, in particular American economists, said, you are crazy, Europeans. This is not never going to work. Our dollar works for our 50 states, despite the great differences between these states uh, in their economic development, in their economic fate. It works because we have two powerful stabilizing mechanisms. One of them is migration between states, and the other one is transfers across states organized at the federal level. You don't have those. Huh? Migration is about six times higher between states in the United States than it is today between the member states of the European Union. And transfers, depending on how they are measured, transfers across states are between 20 and 40 times larger in the United States than they are in the European Union. So the American economists from the left to the right, from Milton Friedman to Amartya Sen, were warning, you are crazy, this is never going to work. And in Europe, people said, mind your own business. You don't want the euro to compete with the dollar, you want to keep using the dollar as the only uh, major reserve currency in the world, and you try to prevent us from doing what's in our interest. Now, of course, people have more hearing for that, and realize that something needs to be done that something like a stabilizer is needed. Now, the stabilizer, we realize in Europe, will never be migration to the same extent as the United States, for one main reason, which is not the only reason, but one main reason, which is that we have so many different native tongues, and that therefore migrating from, uh, say, Athens to Munich is quite a different experience, though the distance is not larger, uh, quite a different experience from migrating from Detroit to Austin, Texas. So we need the other mechanism, absolutely indispensable for the stabilization of uh, the euro, and that other mechanism is transfers across states. And the form it should take, if it is to be generous and sustainable, is not the form of a Finanzausgleich, that is, of a transfer from one state to another state, but it should take the form of soziale Sicherheit, of a form of interpersonal transfer across the borders. Something, of course, that has never happened in the history of mankind, but which is indispensable for the survival of the euro. That's argument number one. Argument number two says, well, uh, we don't only need uh, uh, euro, uh, oh, sorry, the Migration, interstate migration, is not only improbable on a massive uh, level, uh, the sort of level you have in the US, it's also undesirable. Because precisely because of the diversity of languages and cultures, uh, integration is a far costlier uh, process in Europe than it is in the United States. Costlier, both for the people who have to move and for the communities that have to welcome them. And a basic income on a European level would be a stabilizer of the populations. It would enable people in Bulgaria or in Romania and in other places in the world not to be forced to move to the more affluent uh, cities in Europe and be able to stay at, uh, with a smaller income but uh, with a greater quality of life closer to their families, closer to their roots. So second argument is the stabilization of the population, which itself is desirable. It's not that 
movement of people is not sh uh, is not uh, beneficial in many cases, but it shouldn't be the sort of forced movement where people are driven by the inability to live a minimally decent life in their own place. That's argument number two. Argument number three is of a uh, general uh, sort, and uh, it's something that uh, we have seen coming for uh, quite uh, a few decades now, and which is the following, which is the inversion of the relationship between the market and democracy. In the past, our idea of, uh, of the world was one in which we saw the market playing its role, but within the framework of democracies that set the rules of the market game. Increasingly, what has happened as a result of globalization, and more acutely as a result of the single market with its four fundamental freedoms, is that it's no longer the uh, market that is embedded within a democracy, but it's a set of democracies that are submerged in a market and submitted to the rules of the market, competing with each other in terms of competitiveness in the way in which firms use to uh, do and still do. And so states are transformed into, uh, into firms. And of course, one uh, implication of that, among many, is that it becomes increasingly difficult for our nation states to do what some of them didn't do too badly in the past, which is redistribution. Because if you, today, because you are immersed in the larger market, if you have a generous redistribution system where you lose, you tend to lose the net contributors and you tend to attract the net beneficiaries of the system, thereby making your welfare state more fragile. So argument number three is that we need to organize uh, if we want to keep these four fundamental freedoms, the freedom of movement of the people, at least part of the redistribution must operate on a larger scale. Fourth and last uh, argument it's, uh, uh, can be formulated as follows. It's often said that the legitimacy of the European Union, which is now under threat, will only be uh, sort of reinstated, will only be revived, it, through results, results, results. And it's not by changes of the institutions or some, uh, uh, or, or, or singing the, the European anthem, but by um, uh, doing things for the people. But doing things for the people, that's not trying to, to, to implement the TTIP and the free trade arrangement with the United States with the vague promise of a 0.4% increase in the, the, the rate of growth of the European Union and God knows who, uh, who this growth will benefit, uh, will, will benefit. No. Results also means, and must mean in the first place today, that was well put also by the representative from the EAPN today, we need a caring Europe, a, care, uh, that, a Europe that is and is perceived as caring by the citizens. And it can only be a caring Europe if it provides an envelope, it provides a, 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 a socle, uh, so a floor on which a secure floor to the people. And it's only in that way that uh, the European Union will regain the hearts and the allegiance of these people if it is perceived in a tangible way as doing something that is fair to all the people and not only uh, to the more mobile and uh, the, 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 more, the economically more powerful among uh, Europeans. So these are the four basic arguments in favor of a euro dividend. Are there objections uh, to it? Of course, there are objections to it. Hundreds of objections to it. And uh, just as there are thousands of objections to uh, a basic income in general. I've certainly, in the 30 years I've been uh, fighting for the idea, arguing in favor of the idea, I must have heard about 1,584 objections to it. <laughs> but. Uh, of course, there are, there are many and they need to be answered. Some of them are serious, uh, uh, serious objections and I'm sure you'll raise some of them uh, later today. Given that I have only 45 seconds left, uh, what, uh, I'll, I'll just mention one objection which I tackled briefly in the very last paragraph of uh, this uh, short paper in which I present this idea, which you can e easily find on the web. Last objection is, is this not utopian? Of course it is. 
in the sense in which the European Union itself was utopian until not so long ago, and also in the sense in which the social security system was utopian before Bismarck put together its first building blocks at the end of the 19th century. But Bismarck did not create his pension system out of the kindness of his heart. He did so because people started mobilizing in favor of radical reforms across the whole of the Reich he was trying to unify. What are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? Thank you. <laughs>